This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Warlords of Mars Written by Edgar Rice Burroughs and read by J. D. Weber on the south shores of Lake Superior. Chapter 14 The Tide of Battle but Solon's last loud cry had not been without effect, for a moment later a dozen guardsmen burst into the chamber, though not before I had so bent and demolished the great switch that it could not be again used to turn the powerful current into the mighty magnet of destruction it controlled. The result of the sudden coming of the guardsmen had been to compel me to seek seclusion in the first passageway that I could find, and that, to my disappointment, proved to be not the one with which I was familiar but another upon its left. They must have either heard or guessed which way I went, for I had proceeded but a short distance when I heard the sound of pursuit. I had no mind to stop and fight these men here when there was fighting aplenty elsewhere in the city of Carabra, fighting that could be of much more avail to me and mine than useless life-taking far below the palace. But the fellows were pressing me, and as I did not know the way at all, I soon saw that they would overtake me unless I found a place to conceal myself until they had passed, which would then give me an opportunity to return the way I had come and regain the tower, or possibly find a way to reach the city streets. The passageway had risen rapidly since leaving the apartment of the switch, and now ran level and well lighted straight into the distance as far as I could see. The moment that my pursuers reached this straight stretch I would be in plain sight of them with no chance to escape from the corridor undetected. Presently I saw a series of doors opening from either side of the corridor, and as they all looked alike to me, I tried the first one that I reached. It opened into a small chamber, luxuriously furnished, and was evidently an antechamber off some office or audience chamber of the palace. On the far side was a heavily curtained doorway, beyond which I heard the hum of voices. Instantly I crossed the small chamber and, parting the curtains, looked within the larger apartment. Before me were a party of perhaps fifty gorgeously clad nobles of the court, standing before a throne upon which sat Salensis Ole, the Jetic of Jetics, was addressing them. The allotted hour has come, he was saying, as I entered the apartment, and though the enemies of Okar be within her gates, naught may stay the will of Salensis Ole. The great ceremony must be omitted, that no single man may be kept from his place in the defenses other than the fifty that custom demands shall witness the creation of a new queen in Okar. In a moment the thing shall be have done, and we may return to the battle, while she who is now the princess of Helium looks down from the queen's tower upon the annihilation of her former countrymen, and witnesses the greatness which is her husband's. Then, turning to a courier, he issued some command in a low voice. The addressed hastened to a small door at the far end of the chamber, and swinging it wide, cry, Way for Deja Thor's future queen of Okar. Immediately two guardsmen appeared dragging the unwilling bride toward the altar. Her hands were still manacled behind her, evidently to prevent suicide. Her disheveled hair and panting bosom betokened that, chained though she was, still had she fought against the thing that they would do to her. At sight of her, Solensis Ole rose and drew his sword, and the sword of each of the fifty nobles were raised on high to form an ark, beneath which the poor, beautiful creature was dragged toward her doom. A grim smile forced itself to my lips as I thought of the rude awakening that lay in store for the ruler of Okar, and my itching fingers fondled the hilt of my bloody sword. As I watched the procession that moved slowly toward the throne, a procession which consisted of but a handful of priests who followed Deja Thors and the two guardsmen, I caught a fleeting glimpse of a black face peering from behind the draperies that covered the wall back of the dais upon which stood Solensis Ole awaiting his bride. Now the guardsmen were forcing the Princess of Helium up the few steps to the side of the tyrant of Okar, and I had no eyes and no thoughts for aught else. A priest opened a book, and raising his hand, commenced to drone out a single song ritual. Solensis Ole reached for the hand of his bride. I had intended waiting until some circumstance should give me a reasonable hope of success, for even though the entire ceremony should be completed, there could be no valid marriage while I lived. 
What I was most concerned in, of course, was the rescuing of Dejah Thors. I wished to take her from the palace of Salensis Ol, if such a thing were possible, but whether it were accomplished before or after the mock marriage was a matter of secondary import. When, however, I saw the vile hand of Salensis Ol reach out for the hand of my beloved princess, I could restrain myself no longer and before the nobles of Okar knew that aught had happened, I had leaped through their thin line and was upon the dais before Dejah Thoris and Salensis Ol. With the flat of my sword I struck down his polluting hand, and grasping Dejah Thoris round the waist, I swung her behind me as with my back against the draperies of the dais. I faced the tyrant of the north, and his room full of noble warriors. The Jeddak of Jeddaks was a great mountain of a man, a coarse, brutal beast of a man. And as he towered above me there, his fierce black whiskers and mustache bristling in rage, I can well imagine that a less seasoned warrior might have trembled before him. With a snarl he sprang toward me with naked sword, but whether Salensis Ol was a good swordsman or a poor I never learned, for with Dejah Thoris at my back I was no longer human, I was a superman, and no man could have withstood me then. With a single low for the Princess of Helium, I ran my blade straight through the rotten heart of Ukar's rotten ruler, and before the white, drawn faces of his nobles, Solensis Ol rolled, grinning in horrible death, to the foot of the steps below his marriage throne. For a moment, tense silence reigned in the nuptial room. Then the fifty nobles rushed upon me. Furiously we fought, but the advantage was mine, for I stood upon a raised platform above them, and I fought for the most glorious woman of a glorious race and I fought for a great love and for the mother of my boy. And from behind my shoulder, in the silvery cadence of that dear voice, rose the brave battle anthem of Helium which the nation's women sing as their men march out to victory. That alone was enough to inspire me to victory over even greater odds, and I verily believe that I should have bested the entire roomful of yellow warriors that day in the nuptial chamber of the palace of Carabra had not interruption come to my aid. Fast and furious was the fighting as the nobles of Salensis Ol sprang, time and again, up the steps before the throne, only to fall back before a sword hand that seemed to have gained a new wizardry from its experience with the cunning Solan. Two were pressing me so closely that I could not turn when I heard a movement behind me, and noted that the sound of the battle anthem had ceased. Was Dejah Thoris preparing to take her place beside me? heroic daughter of heroic world, it would not be unlike her to have seized a sword and fought at my side, for though the women of Mars are not trained in the arts of war, the spirit is theirs, and they have been known to do that very thing upon countless occasions. But she did not come, and glad I was, for it would have doubled my burden in protecting her before I should have been able to force her back again out of harm's way. She must be contemplating some cunning strategy, I thought, and so I fought on secure in the belief that my divine princess stood close behind me. For half an hour at least I must have fought there against the nobles of Okar, ere ever one placed a foot upon the dais where I stood, and then of a sudden all that remained of them formed below me for a last, mad, desperate charge. But even as they advanced, the door at the far end of the chamber swung wide, and a wild-eyed messenger sprang into the room. The Jeddak of Jeddaks, he cried, where is the Jeddak of Jeddaks? This city has fallen before the hordes from beyond the barrier, and but now the great gate of the palace itself has been forced, and the warriors of the south are pouring into its sacred precincts. Where is Salensis Ol? He alone may revive the flagging courage of our warriors. He alone may save the day for Okar. Where is Salensis Ol? The nobles stepped back from about the dead body of their ruler, and one of them pointed to the grinning corpse. The messenger staggered back in horror as though from a blow in the face. Then fly, nobles of Okar, he cried, for naught can save you. Hark, they come. As he spoke, we heard the deep roar of angry men from the corridor without, and the clank of metal and the clang of swords. Without another glance toward me, who had stood a spectator of the tragic scene, the nobles wheeled and fled from the apartment through another exit. Almost immediately a force of yellow warriors appeared in the doorway through which the messenger had come. They were backing toward the apartment, stubbornly resisting the advance of a handful of red men who faced them and forced them slowly but inevitably back. 
above the heads of the contestants, I could see from my elevated station upon the dais the face of my old friend Cantos Can. He was leading the little party that had won its way into the very heart of the palace of Salensis Ol. In an instant I saw that by attacking the Ocarians from the rear I could so quickly disorganize them that their further resistance would be short-lived, and with this idea in mind I sprang from the dais, casting a word of explanation to Dejah Thors over my shoulder, though I did not turn to look at her. With myself ever between her enemies and herself, and with Cantos Can and his warriors winning to the apartment, there could be no danger to Dejah Thors standing there alone beside the throne. I wanted the men of Helium to see me and to know that their beloved princess was here too, for I knew that this knowledge would inspire them to even greater deeds of valor than they had performed in the past, though great indeed must have been those which won for them a way into the almost impregnable palace of the tyrant of the north. As I crossed the chamber to attack the Cadabrans, from the rear a small doorway at my left opened and to my surprise revealed the figures of Mata Shang, father of Therns, and Feodor, his daughter, peering into the room. A quick glance about they took. Their eyes rested for a moment wide in horror upon the dead body of Salensis Ol, upon the blood that crimsoned the floor, upon the corpse of the nobles, who had fallen thick before the throne, upon me and upon the battling warriors at the other door. They did not essay to enter the apartment, but scanned its every corner from where they stood, and then, when their eyes had sought its entire area, a look of fierce rage overspread the features of Mata Shang, and a cold and cunning smile touched the lips of Feodor. Then they were gone, but not before a taunting laugh was thrown directly in my face by the woman. I did not understand then the meeting of Mata Shang's rage or Feodor's pleasure, but I knew that neither boded good for me. A moment later I was upon the backs of the yellow men, and as the red men of Helium saw me above the shoulders of their antagonists, a great shout rang through the corridor, and for a moment drowned the noise of battle. For the Prince of Helium, they cried, for the Prince of Helium! And like hungry lions upon their prey, they fell once more upon the weakened warriors of the north. The yellow men, cornered between two enemies, fought with the desperation that utter hopelessness often induces. Fought, as I should have fought, had been in their steed, with the determination to take as many of my enemies with me when I died as lay within the power of my sword-arm. It was a glorious battle, but the end seemed inevitable, when presently from down the corridor behind the red men came a great body of reinforcing yellow warriors. Now were the tables turned, and it was the men of Helium who seemed doomed to be ground between two millstones. All were compelled to turn to meet this new assault by a greatly superior force so that to me was left the remnants of the yellow men within the throne room. They kept me busy, too, so busy that I began to wonder if indeed I should have ever been done with them. Slowly they pressed me back into the room, and when they had all passed in after me, one of them closed and bolted the door, effectually barring the way against the men of Cantos Can. It was a clever move, for it put me at the mercy of a dozen men within a chamber from which assistance was locked out, and it gave the red men in the corridor beyond no avenue of escape, should their new antagonists press them too closely. But I have faced heavier odds myself than were pitted against me that day, and I knew that Cantos Can had battled his way from a hundred more dangerous traps than that in which he now was. So it was with no feelings of despair that I turned my attention to the business of the moment. Constantly my thoughts reverted to Dejah Thors, and I longed for the moment when, the fighting done, I could fold her in my arms, and hear once more the words of love which had been denied me for so many years. During the fighting in the chamber, I had not even a single chance to so much as steal a glance at her where she stood behind me, beside the throne of the dead ruler. I wondered why she no longer urged me on with the strains of the martial hymn of Helium. But I did not need more than the knowledge that I was battling for her to bring out the best that is in me. It would be wearisome to narrate the details of that bloody struggle, of how we fought from the doorway, the full length of the room to the very foot of the throne before the last of my antagonists fell with my blade piercing his heart. And then, with a glad cry, I turned with outstretched arms to seize my princess, 
and as my lips smothered hers to reap the reward that would be thrice ample payment for the bloody encounters through which I had passed, for her dear sake, from the South Pole to the North. The glad cry died, frozen upon my lips. My arms dropped limp and lifeless to my sides. As one who reels beneath the burden of a mortal wound, I staggered up the steps before the throne. Dejah Thoris was gone. End of chapter 14